Now we turn our attention to the pathology portion of psychiatry, and we will discuss a wide variety of psychiatric illnesses in this section. Step 1. Frequently test this material. So, trying to answer questions without at least a little memorization here will drive you insane. Pun intended. Why so serious? Let's start off with infant deprivation effects. Now, there's many effects to be familiar with, but the long-term ones are developmental problems such as loss of muscle coordination, as well as decreased muscle tone. Infants can also have weight loss, and in severe cases, they can have malnutrition. They have retarded growth, and therefore end up with a short stature. There's also increased incidence of physical illness due to a weakened immune system. Also look out for signs of unresponsiveness in the case of anaclytic depression. And deprivation that is greater than six months can lead to irreversible changes. One way to help you remember the infant deprivation effects is the mnemonic of the four W's, like wah, 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 like a crying infant. They are weak, wordless, wanting, and wary. The wanting here means socially wanting. And the wary means that they are, or they seem suspicious of people around them. They don't have that natural social behavior that an infant who is taken care of normally has. And remember that deprivation greater than six months can be irreversible. All right, now let's talk about the very sad case of child abuse. It's not only a board's relevant topic, but it's also very important for your clinical experience. There's two main types of child abuse that you'll be expected to understand. Physical abuse and sexual abuse. So physical abuse can manifest as a child with multiple healed fractures on x-ray. Types of fractures can include helical fractures or spiral fractures, which are caused by a twisting motion, a twisting motion when the child's limb is violently twisted. Children can also have cigarette burns, which will be circular burns on the skin, subdural hematomas, which are caused by the tearing of which veins when the child is shaken. The answer is the bridging veins. Remember that these veins run from the surface of the brain to the dura mater. Also look for retinal hemorrhages or retinal detachment, which can be caused by shaking of the child. And physical abuse is usually caused by a male caregiver and causes about 3,000 deaths per year in the United States, with most victims being less than 3 years of age. Sexual abuse often manifests as genital or anal trauma and may even present as a child with STDs or UTIs. Sexual abuse is usually inflicted by a male that is known to the victim. And sexual abuse is most common in the 9 to 12 year old range. Child neglect refers to the failure to provide a child with adequate food, shelter, supervision, education, and or affection and is the most common form of mistreatment. Usually, children will present with poor hygiene, malnutrition, withdrawal, social withdrawal, of course, not drug withdrawal, or even failure to thrive. Such clinical scenarios must be reported to local child protective services, even if doing so represents a violation of doctor-patient confidentiality. On a similar note, Reporting suspected elder abuse is also mandatory in most states. Okay, flash quiz. 
A young girl with a history of urinary tract infections presents with multiple bruises and decreased vision in the right eye. Ophthalmic evaluation revealed retinal detachment, imaging studies revealed healed fractures, and subdural hematoma. These findings may be evidence of which condition? The answer is child abuse. The urinary tract infections suggest sexual abuse, and the bruises, retinal detachment, fractures, and subdural hematoma are all indicative of physical abuse. So be on the lookout for these signs on your boards as well as in your clinical practice. Now we're going to take a look at some childhood and early onset disorders. First of all, ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is characterized by a limited attention span, poor impulse control, hyperactivity, motor impairment such as the lack of ability to perform complex and coordinated tasks, and emotional lability, meaning lots of mood swings. It has an age of onset of around 7 years. And children with ADHD often have normal intelligence but commonly have difficulty in school. Up to 50% of children will continue to be affected as adults. There's three main treatments for ADHD. Methylphenidate, better known by the brand name Ritalin, as well as atomoxetine, which is a non-stimulant SNRI, a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, as well as amphetamines, like the brand name drug Adderall. So Adderall, which is an amphetamine, and methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin. Of course, many of you know that there's a lot of controversy over the use of these drugs in the U.S., with many experts believing that we're over-medicating our children for normal childhood behavior. Next is conduct disorder. This refers to repetitive and pervasive behavior that violates social norms, often manifested by aggressive, destructive, sometimes illegal activities. By definition, this disorder must begin before age 18. And if it begins after, it's referred to as antisocial personality disorder, which we'll discuss in more detail later. So if you have a child who frequently causes disturbances in class by repeatedly trying to remove his clothing, what would this child be considered to have? Conduct disorder not antisocial personality disorder. Just remember that both conduct and child start with C. So children have conduct disorder, whereas adults have antisocial personality disorder. You can think of the antisocial starts with an A, and adult starts with an A, so antisocial for adult and conduct for child. Now let's study oppositional defiant disorder, which is characterized by a pattern of defiant behavior towards authority figures. But the child does not really behave outside of social norms. Basically, imagine a child who talks back to teachers. That would be oppositional defiant disorder. Next is a well-known disorder but often mischaracterized and misrepresented in the media, and that is Tourette syndrome. It's characterized by a sudden, rapid, and recurrent, non-rhythmic, stereotyped motor movement or vocalization called tics. And these sudden, rapid, repetitive, non-rhythmic movements have to persist for more than one year to be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. By most estimates, it affects between 0.1 and 1% of the general population. Now, also keep in mind that there can be vocal tics, not just motor tics, vocal tics will be 
obviously sudden sounds that the person makes, uh, sudden stereotypical uh, and recurrent sounds. Now, popular media often demonstrates these patients as suffering from coprolalia or obscene speech, though this only occurs in a minority of patients, about 20%. And there's a strong association with obsessive compulsive disorder. Usually, Tourette's syndrome is treated with antipsychotics such as haloperidol. Separation anxiety disorder is where the child has overwhelming anxiety about being away from home or loved ones. This can lead to nightmares and physical complaints that are real or imagined, often as a way to avoid going to school or being otherwise separated from the parent. And it's not to be confused with separation anxiety, which is part of the normal milestone development in infants and toddlers. Separation anxiety disorder becomes a disorder because it's overwhelming and leads to physical complaints that are sometimes real or imagined. It usually shows up before the teen years, so be on the lookout for that. Okay, flash quiz. Which drugs are used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Answers are methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin, amphetamines, one of which is Adderall, and adamoxetine. Interestingly, all of these drugs are stimulants, and it seems paradoxical to give hyperactive children with ADHD stimulants. However, the way that they work is they're helping the child to concentrate, and it's thought they do this by stimulating the areas of the brain that control focus and concentration. And so therefore, they help these hyperactive children who can be easily distracted to better focus 